6. Listen, this is not the time to tune out. This is as much a part of worship as anything else. How many of you know that worship is reading God's word? Worship is praying. Worship is singing uh, to the Lord Jesus. Worship comes from the heart, but worship is also giving. Giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse of God's food so that people can continue to be fed. And so I want you to pray and ask the Lord about becoming a partner with Hope and Passion Ministries. You can do this by going to hopeandpassion.org. Now there's a way for you to give a one-time donation or become a monthly partner using PayPal. But the question has recently come up, what about just using my credit card? Yes, that is an option. If you go under the blue highlighted tab for PayPal, you'll see that you can do it directly through credit card as well. Don't forget we're also on Venmo now. Search Hope and Passion Ministries on Venmo and you can give directly that way. We are so grateful that we have partners now from other states and uh, other countries uh, because this is the only way that God is going to keep us moving forward is through your giving. There are a lot of costs involved in broadcasting, in the website upkeep, in the production of videos, and in the full-time work that I do, in the, in the uh, part-time work that our technical department does. And speaking of, uh, our senior technical department is working remotely today. I mean, come on. COVID is nearly over. I guess it is over. So what are you doing working remote? But she's out there working remote. And uh, the junior, the senior most junior technical department person is here. I have Shaylin with me in studio helping. So thanks to them. But know that you can get in touch with us with your questions, with your prayer requests, and with your giving. We certainly do need you today. All right. Have you eaten any scrolls lately? This message this morning is coming from Revelation chapter 10. We are going to pray together in a minute. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 10 with you first. So if you have a Bible, please turn to it. I'll be using the English Standard Version. I'm going to read this text. It's 11 verses long, and we're going to pray. We went over verses 1 and 2 last week, so we'll, we won't look in detail at those. We're going to pick it up really at the heart at verse 3. Revelation 10.1, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets." And the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. And I'm so grateful for a group of people who come with expectation to hear from you in your word. This is what the church of Jesus Christ, God, 
is to be about the business of, and that is being excited to be both comforted and convicted by your word. This is the only way that we can grow in Jesus Christ is to focus on the word that you have spoken, not the opinions, not the thoughts of man about your word, but to stay laser focused on the word that has been revealed to us in these 66 books that you have given. And so God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work mightily this morning and through the rebroadcast of this message. I thank you for the testimonies that continue to roll in day after day from people who are being saved. Lord Jesus, I think of the young one on TikTok just yesterday who said that he is so grateful to have come to know the Christ of heaven and his Father. Lord, I'm thankful every day for the testimonies that come in of people who say, I've been to church my whole life, I've known Jesus a long time, but now I'm on fire for his kingdom. Lord, let it happen again today. We depend upon your Holy Spirit. I pray against every power of hell that would try to distract and dissuade people, and I ask that we would be able to tune, tune in with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, to what it is you're saying this morning. Continue to bless Hope and Passion Ministries, dear Lord. Continue to provide. Continue to bless our donors, our prayer warriors. And I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Okay, here we go. Oops, let me see if my clicker, uh-oh, my clicker is not working. So let me just pause for one second and go to my PowerPoint and make sure that this is all okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, no problems. All right, here we are. First of all, we're in Revelation chapter 10, and we're dealing with this mighty angel with a little scroll. Revelation chapter 10, you need to know, when you're reading the book of Revelation chronologically, chapter to chapter, you need to understand the flow of thought. So chapter 10 is a parentheses chapter, and we've encountered one of those already, and we'll encounter a little bit more of that, but this is a parentheses or an interlude chapter. So what happens is, if you remember, chapter 9 included the last, not the last trumpet, but the sixth trumpet judgment, which was the unleashing of four demons at the river Euphrates who, who put upon the earth 200 million mounted troops of demons that are allowed to kill a third of mankind. We have faced real tragedy in the thick of the trumpet judgments in Revelation chapter 9. And by the time we get to Revelation chapter 11, we'll encounter the seventh trumpet judgment, which is really the unleashing of all of the seven bowls of God's wrath, which ends the tribulation period. So it's as if God, in the middle of all of this judgment and tumultuous activity, pauses to give John and to give us a vision of a mighty angel. And then at the beginning of chapter 11, before we hit trumpet seven, we're also going to be introduced to two mighty witnesses for the Lord during the great tribulation. So we're in an interlude. We're in a parentheses chapter, if you will. Okay, that's where we are in Revelation 10. Now, last week we discussed Revelation chapter 10, verses one and two, but let's reread them for continuity. Uh, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, his legs like pillars of fire. This is obviously a very mighty angel. We've seen another mighty angel in the book of Revelation. We discussed last week that this is not Jesus Christ. He does not appear as an angel in the book of Revelation. Only in the Old Testament do we have the pre-incarnate Jesus, sometimes referred to as the angel of the Lord. But once he put on flesh and came to this earth, ascended and went to the throne of the Father, 
He is not ever revealed as an angel anymore. He is known for who he is, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And in the book of Revelation, he is the post-incarnate Christ. Amen. He's the coming king. So this is a very mighty angel delivering a message from the Lord. This angel had a little scroll that was open in his hand. He set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. If you didn't hear last week's sermon, get on YouTube and make sure that you hear that. But we believe this scroll is a little scroll because it is the same one. It is the title deed to the earth, which Jesus took from the hand of God the Father on the throne in the beginning of the book of Revelation. Jesus took that, I believe it was Revelation chapter 5, and he began to unleash the seal judgments. So this is the title deed to the earth that belongs to God alone. And it is little now because a lot of it has already been unrolled and unveiled. But now we stand at the great tribulation. So the mighty angel has this scroll. The angel has one foot on the land, one foot on the sea to show the power and the sovereignty of God. And now we come to verse 3. This mighty angel called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. Now, like a lion roaring. What Do any of you who are familiar with the Bible, does that make you think of anything? Hopefully there's a verse, even if you don't know the reference for it, that's coming to mind. And that is 1 Peter 5.8. Where the Bible tells us that we as Christians... We as believers in Jesus Christ must be sober-minded. We need to be watchful. And I'll tell you what, these are two things that I do not see largely in the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry to report that many people in many churches today, watchfulness and sober-mindedness is not the word. It's more like a feeling of comfortableness where you go to church and you get your fill of your, your uh, uplifting message, whatever it is you hear, you sing to have a little bit of fellowship, you go do whatever you do during the week. But that's not the life of a Christian. A Christian is to be sober-minded and watchful at all times because if you're really a believer in the Lord, you have an enemy. He is Satan. He is the devil. And he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to actually eat up and devour and destroy. And so we see this mighty angel in Revelation who roars also like a lion. But we know that the devil tries to roar like a lion. Isn't it interesting that everything that Satan does is just an imitation or a perversion of what God truly is? Do you ever think about that? Satan is not a creator. He's a created being. He has no power except the power that God has allowed him to have. He cannot create anything. And so all he can do is twist and pervert what God has already made. Just like the coming Antichrist is just a twisting or a perversion of the true Christ. And so Satan tries to roar like a lion. But I want to note something. Satan roars to intimidate. He does it to make you anxious. He tries to seek to destroy. If you're a child of God and you are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan does not have power over you unless you allow him through his intimidation to take that power. All right? And we've all done that and we've all been there. But I want you to know that his roar is to make you anxious because he wants to take you down. He wants you not to move forward in God's plan for your life. Whereas when God roars... He's not doing it with deception or imitation to try to make people anxious. He roars in truth to judge and bring righteousness. So when this mighty angel is roaring, it's not to try to scare people uh, who shouldn't be scared. That's what the devil does. But it is to declare in truth and righteousness who God is what God is doing in the world, and what the human response needs to be in order to find safety. And there's a big difference. We must remember James chapter 4, verse 7. 
The Bible says there, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil, Christian. This is to Christians now. Non-Christians have no ability to resist the devil. And I just want to put that out there. If you are not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't have power to resist the devil. But if you're a Christian, you are commanded to resist the devil. And the Bible says he will flee from you. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ, you can resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil by the power of God and the devil's going to run. But guess what? If you try to resist God in cooperation with the devil, God remains. Amen. That came to me the other day when I was taking notes on this. I thought, you know what? We are commanded to resist the devil knowing that the devil will run. But when people try to resist God, does God run? No, God keeps coming after you. Matter of fact, you can't even resist God throughout all of eternity. You will still be dealing with the righteous, holy God. Whether it is in relationship with him in the new heaven and new earth, or whether you are dealing with the wrath and judgment of God in hell, you will never be able to run from God. God never flees. But my Christian friend, the devil will when you resist him. The Bible says in Joel chapter 3, verse 16, the very prophetic book of the Bible, the Lord roars from Zion. The Lord roars from Jerusalem. He utters his voice. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. You see that? When God roars, Christians do not have to fear because we have a refuge in Jesus Christ. He has covered us from God's coming wrath. Hallelujah. But God does roar like a lion. And when he does so, he does so in truth. When the devil roars at you, Christian, he's trying to intimidate you. He's trying to make you anxious. He's trying to throw you off track. But God is greater. Amen? That feels like a little sermon right there. Are we done? Is this it? <laughs> no. We're going to keep going. But that's good stuff. I want you to, those of you who needed to hear that, let the Holy Spirit put that well into your heart. And maybe memorize James chapter 4, verse 7. Okay. When this mighty angel called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring, the seven thunders sounded. Now these seven thunders are a very mysterious thing, even to Bible scholars today. But we know that God has told us enough for us to understand what we need to know. So let's look at the seven thunders. J. Vernon McGee, he said this, Dr. Vincent makes this very enlightening comment. The Jews were accustomed to speak of thunder as the seven voices. These seven thunders here are the voice of God. So the Jews had a custom of speaking of thunder as the seven voices. J. Vernon McGee said, I think it is the voice of the Lord Jesus now in heaven confirming what this angel has claimed because he's going to come to power on this earth. See, seven is God's number of completion or perfection. We, we know we talked about the seven spirits in the beginning of Revelation, which really refers to the, the, the seven, uh, the manifold working of the Holy Spirit, the perfection of God. The seven spirits is really the complete Holy Spirit. And these seven thunders are the voice of God, the voice of perfection, the voice of completion, the voice that's saying everything is about to be culminated. Everything that I have planned is about to be completed. In Job 37, 5, we hear this cooperating scripture. God thunders wonderfully with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. And so when this mighty angel roars, seven thunders sound and I agree with J. Vernon McGee that that is none other than the voice of Jesus Christ the voice of God thundering from heaven and when the seven thunders had sounded John said I was about to write 
You know, because John is receiving this revelation from Jesus Christ and he's recording it. This is back in like 95 AD so that we now have it today. And so he takes up his pen and he's about to write after the seventh thunder sounded. But he heard a voice from heaven saying this, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. What an odd thing. You know, it puts me in mind toward the end of Revelation I believe it's Revelation chapter 21. Yes, it is Revelation 21. When John gets the vision of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, the new heaven and the new earth, and God's just saying, I'm going to make everything new, and there's not going to be any more crying or pain or death anymore. The, the Bible tells us, you know, that God kind of had to nudge John and say, hey, John, write this down. <laughs> because he got so caught up in the glory of it all, I picture his jaw was just hanging open. He's like, could this be real? That this new heaven and new earth, is it really going to be like this? And God had to nudge him to write it down. But here, we see God telling John, seal this up and don't write it down. Interesting. This is the only place that the book of Revelation is sealed. This is the only place I should say within the book of Revelation that there is a sealing that is done. Now let me explain to you what I mean. When we go back to the book of Daniel, which is a highly prophetic book. Daniel is a wonderful book. I once taught the book of Daniel to one group of believers simultaneously as I was teaching Revelation to another group. And what a blessing. Those books go hand in hand. Daniel is a highly prophetic book. And when God gave Daniel his visions, the Lord said, you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the whole book. So Daniel's writing back, you know, uh, 500 years before Jesus ever came. And God said, shut up and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. In other words, God is saying, Daniel, in your time and in your day, uh, it, this is to be sealed. Nobody can really understand or take in what's going on. And even Daniel himself would literally grow ill as he received the visions of what was to come. And God promised that in the future, people would run to and fro. Uh, we're not, uh, scholars debate what that means, but many say uh, it means that people will be able to begin, eyes will run to and fro through the scriptures in the future Knowledge will increase because we'll have been in the world longer. We'll have seen more prophecies be fulfilled. We'll be able to put two and two together. And as we explore the prophetic word of God more and more, and as we learn to discern the times and the days in which we live, God was pretty much saying, there'll be a day, Daniel, when this book will begin to make more and more sense to people. My friends, we're living in that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the word of God, the prophetic word of God makes more sense than ever. You know, we were so blessed to have a hope and passion board of directors meeting, an in-person meeting after all this long time of COVID. You know, we keep in touch, but we were able to gather together as a board of directors and meet. And one of the things that we were talking about uh, with the wonderful gentleman that is on our board of directors, Mr. John Reel, uh, what a wonderful man. And we were just excited because we were talking about my goodness, we're living in a day and age when we see not just a sign here or a sign there, you know, even when we think about the creation of the state of Israel, you know, decades ago, we're, we're talking about the convergence of so many biblical signs and prophecies. It's incredible. So I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting excited here. But I want to tell you, God told Daniel seal up this book for a time, but knowledge will increase. People will come to understand the word of God and it will become opened up to them. But in Revelation 22.10, at the end of Revelation, when God gave Revelation to John at the end of the first century AD, he said, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is near. Okay? So in other words, Jesus has come in the flesh. He's died. He's resurrected. There's a lot more that can be seen here. The Roman Empire is in place. Things that God prophesied to Daniel are starting to take place. And God says, don't seal up Revelation because the time is near. Hallelujah. 
So the book as a whole is not sealed, but these seven thunders, what was said by the seven thunders, that part is sealed. Interesting. Everybody still with me? I don't, like I said, I don't have, uh, I can't see the hearts and the likes this morning, all right? But I'm believing that you're as excited as I am. I'm believing that some of you are getting lifted up by the Spirit of God this morning, getting excited for what he's doing. William Barclay said this about the seven thunders, all right? He said, we simply know that John had experiences which he could not communicate to others. God sometimes tells a man more than that man can say or than his generation can understand. You know, maybe John was going to write that down and God knew uh, uh, this is not to be a part of my inspired word because it's too much for you to even say or reveal, John. And I think of the Apostle Paul. William Barclay's right because I think of the Apostle Paul. How many of you know that Paul... By the way, let me pause here for a minute and say something. This is one of my big pet peeves. The Apostle Paul, other than Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul is the only human being we know that actually went to the third heaven, to the presence of God, to heaven, and came back with any information. Okay? God has given us the canon of scripture, the 66 books of the Bible. And everything that we can know about heaven is in that book. And I would be very careful if I were you about reading books where people say that they've been, they've actually been to heaven or hell and come back to tell about it. No matter how good their stuff seems, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how much you want to cling to what they're saying, if it's outside the word of God, it cannot be counted upon. And I want to show you why here. You know, we're talking about John couldn't reveal what the seven thunders said. The Apostle Paul, speaking very humbly, he, he speaks of himself in a third person here. But he had been caught up to paradise, to the third heaven, to the presence of God. And he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. In other words, Paul wasn't even aware if his flesh had been taken up or it hadn't. But he said, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Again, he repeats, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And this man heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Okay? The apostle Paul was taken in the spirit or in the flesh to heaven and he was told things that man may not utter. Now, if the Apostle Paul actually went to heaven and was not allowed to record the things that he heard and saw, I highly doubt that there is any human being today that God is giving that special privilege of doing. And all I'm saying to you is whether their testimony seems good or it doesn't seem good, we must measure everything against the word of God. We cannot add or take away from the word of God. And many people are being misled into what truly happens at death because of people's claims. Okay, so it's just a little rabbit trail there, side note, but it's very important. Everything you ever want to know about heaven, you can find in the Bible. That's what God wanted you to know, and it is enough for me. How many can testify? It is enough for me. I had an event many times called the heaven event, right? And I teach on heaven, but I teach only what the Bible reveals to us. So John was told, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Don't even write it down. It's not to be revealed. Leon Morris said about this, a further value in our knowledge that the thunders are sealed is that it is a warning against the kind of date fixing that has characterized some schemes of prophecy based on this book. And I'll tell you what, God said, no man knows the day or the hour. We know now that the time is nearer than when we first believed. Amen? We know that Jesus' coming is nearer, nearer, nearer every day, but we cannot set a date. And perhaps that's part of what God was doing here. On John's own showing, we do not have all the information. God has kept some things back from us. Let us not proceed as though all has been revealed. 
You know, there's some people who think they just have to absolutely know every detail. And when they teach and they preach, they act as if they know everything. But you will honestly often hear me say, scholars divide over this. Here's my opinion on the matter. What we cannot know for sure, we cannot know for sure, but we can know the main thrust of what God wants us to understand. And it is enough for us. Verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the seas and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. So this mighty angel swears by God. This is another reason that we know this angel is not Jesus. Because if this angel were Christ, he would have sworn by himself. You can look that up later in Hebrews 6.13. I don't have time to go there, but Hebrews 6.13 shows us that God doesn't swear by anybody but by himself. Okay? And that's what this mighty angel did. And what he did was he swore that there would be no more delay. So here we are in Revelation 10. We're about to see the seventh trumpet sound, which is the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath, the very end of the tribulation. And the Bible says there will be no more delay. This is the answer to the prayers of the slain saints of Revelation 6.10. Do you remember those saints during the seal judgments? John saw souls under the altar. And they were crying out, how long, O Lord, until you take revenge on our enemies? How long, O Lord, must we wait? This is an answer to their prayer. Not long. Not long must you wait until God fulfills his word that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. This is also an answer to the prayer that Jesus instructed us by in Matthew 6.10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's, there's not much time left, my friends, before we will see heaven come to earth. Before we see the throne of God descend to this newly remade earth that we will live on. Hallelujah. Where we will see God face to face. Not much time left. God hears our prayers. There would be no more delay. It now is going to be a very short time until Christ returns, the angel is saying. And it reminds me of this cooperating scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. What a beautiful scripture beginning at verse 36. If you're wearing out and you're wearing down, my brother or sister in Christ, remember this. You have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Keep holding on. The promise is coming. And you will receive it if you keep holding on. Then the writer of Hebrews says, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, he says, Yet a little while, and the coming one will come. And when he, and when he starts, he will not delay. Won't be long before Jesus comes. And once the Lord sets these tribulation days into motion. Won't be, there won't be any more delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. I'll tell you what, I do not want to be a person that God has no pleasure in. If you want to be a person that God does not have that God has pleasure in and is not displeased with, then we need to not shrink back. See, these days of difficulty, these days when all hell is coming against true Christianity, these days of moral values falling apart, these days of spiritual chaos and moral darkness are no days to shrink back. These are days to take the light to the darkness. Amen? Amen? To stand strong for Jesus because we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. But we are of those who have faith and preserve our souls. Hallelujah. Open up your Bibles this week 
Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Reread this scripture. Underline it in your Bible. Write it down on an index card. Hang it up on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. Put it in your pocket. Put it in your purse. And remember, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Praise God. We are those who press forward. We have faith. And we know he's coming soon. Verse 7, that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, so that's the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. The mystery of God. What does that mean? That doesn't tell us directly, but I have a number of scholars that I agree with on this. John Phillips said this. He believes the mystery is the secret of God's allowing Satan to have his own way and man too. For such a time. In other words, what is the mystery of God? The question, why has God allowed this to happen? Why the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? Why did he allow Satan to fall? Why has evil taken place at all? I believe one day God will show us. Warren Wearsby agrees, and he says the mystery of God has to do with the age-old problem of evil in the world. Why is there evil in the world? What is God doing through all this? That's the mystery of God. J. Vernon McGee believes the same. He said the basic problem is this. Why did God permit evil? And why has he tolerated it for so long? I love how J. Vernon McGee talks. He says... Do you want to know something? I have studied theology for many years, and I know the answers men give. But God has not handed in his answer yet. And he is going to do so one day. Praise God. The mystery of God, the mystery of all of God's working in the world will soon be fulfilled. Who cannot wait for that day? When we stand in the light of the glory of God, when our sinful bodies have been remade into glorified bodies so that we can actually stand in the presence of God and not melt away and disappear, when we stand in the full glory of God, as I've often said, it'll be like, you know, what we think we know now, it'll be like a little a flickering candle that you hold up to the noonday sun. The noonday sun far outshines that. And we will suddenly know what we couldn't understand here in our broken bodies, our sinful bodies, our broken minds, our broken world. Thank God for the mystery of God. The mystery of God will be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Talking about the mystery of God, I don't know how many of you were there, but I had an event once. I rented out a middle school auditorium, and I had an event called The End, According to God. And it was all about what the end is, according to God, the end of this world, you know. And I remember starting off the whole thing by asking people, why do humans like fairy tales? You think about it, Fairy tales are incredible because there's always a struggle. There's always a plot, you know, and there's always a struggle. And then in the end, it's like happily ever after. Good wins. Everybody lives happily ever after. Perfection. My question is, why do we like fairy tales? Why, why are we as humans even able to write fairy tales? I got to thinking deeply about this the other day, and I was like, you know, if atheism were true, if materialism were true, and there is no personal God behind the universe, no creator, and this is all just blind random chance, which that doesn't even make sense. There's a whole lot of problems with that to begin with. But if that were true, and it's just survival of the fittest, and it's just randomness, then we humans wouldn't even be able to conceptualize of what perfection is. Because this world is broken. Nothing is perfect in this world. We aren't perfect. Relationships aren't perfect. Nature is not perfect. Nothing is perfect. So if, it, if there is no perfection that transcends the world, then where did we humans, if our brains are only the result of uh, the knocking around together of random chemicals and neurons, 
then where did we ever conceptualize the idea of perfection? That's a good question. And the answer is because we have been made in the image of a perfect God. Now that image has been marred, but we, we still have it. And that's proof that there is a God that exists. We like fairy tales because somewhere deep inside we know that's the way it's supposed to be. Amen? C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Hallelujah. If you wish your life were a fairy tale, if you want it to end up happily ever after, then come into the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen out there? Come into the kingdom of God because the mystery of God will soon be fulfilled and we will see perfection one day, my friends. Oh, I just thank him and I praise him this morning for the hope that fills our heart through his word. The mystery of God will be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Yes, as you're seeing, Revelation connects to the entire Bible. It goes back to the Old Testament. God is going to get his way. You know, way back in Genesis 3.15, right after Adam and Eve sinned, when God pronounced the curse on the serpent, do you know what he said to the serpent? Eve's offspring, her progeny, the one that comes from Eve's line is going to crush your head, Satan. Way back in Genesis 3.15, God prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Now, Adam and Eve didn't know when, you know, for all they knew, it could have been their firstborn son. You know, they didn't know how long this process would take, but God promised the conquering Messiah to crush the head of Satan, to crush evil, to stamp down sin under his feet. And that day is coming. That day is coming. And then I think of the Old Testament prophecy Oh, Isaiah 25, and because I'm very hungry this morning as I'm preaching, I only had two, two fried eggs for breakfast. I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, when I get physically hungry like this, do you know what I let it remind me of? I, I try purposely to let it remind me of the real spiritual hunger we should have. That's what fasting is about, by the way. Getting us to focus on God and what our true hunger should be. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. But speaking of hunger, Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. You want to hear a wonderful promise? Here's another passage you might want to highlight in your Bible, an Old Testament prophecy of the book of Revelation and what's going to happen. Listen to this. God says, on this mountain, the mountain in Jerusalem, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. So that means we're going to get some kind of meat, right? Better meat than the meat we know from dead animals in this world. But we're going to have rich meat. We're not going to have wine that makes us drunk. How many of you know the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine what the wine of God in heaven is going to be like? How intoxicating with the Holy Spirit, and I mean that in the most reverent and wonderful way, when all of our desires in God are finally fulfilled. Listen to this. We are going to eat. We're going to have a banquet up there. And verse 7, God will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples. The veil that is spread over all nations. Doesn't it seem today there's kind of like a veil of darkness and you can hardly even get through to people what's really going on? That'll be taken away. Look at verse 8. And God will swallow up death forever. God's just going to swallow up death. Right now, death swallows us up. I got to tell you something. There's a day coming when God's going to swallow death up. Hallelujah. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And that sound like revelation? And the reproach of his people he'll take away from all the earth. We won't stink in the eyes of people anymore. We will be the ones that people look to. For the Lord has spoken. Praise God. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited 
for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. That is the mystery of God fulfilled. Hallelujah. Verse 8, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. This angel is claiming all territory for God. And the voice tells John, go and take the scroll from that angel. You know, the angel that's wrapped in a cloud, got a rainbow over his head. You know, the angel who has one leg on the sea and one on the land. His legs are like pillars of fire. Yeah, just go up to him and ask him for the scroll. <laughs> ask him for the scroll. I just try to picture this and I think, John, wow, you had a big task. That would be a little bit scary, right? But the voice from heaven told him to take the scroll. And I want you to notice, told him, go take the scroll. It wasn't handed to him. Interesting point. You and I are not force-fed the word. Hallelujah. We're not force-fed the word. We must willingly take it. It's called a scroll because, you know, there was a day when books weren't bound like we have them today. When John wrote, when the New Testament was written, it was written on parchment, on scrolls, rolled up and sealed. John is told to take the scroll and eat it. And I want to tell you something. God won't force feed you the word. You have to will to take the word and to eat the word. Praise God. I hope you can see where this is going. Verse 9. So John said, I went to the angel and I told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Now, first of all, the mighty angel said to John, go ahead, take the scroll, but I want you to eat it. What does that mean? I don't have time to go there. Please refer to it this week. Ezekiel was also told to eat a scroll. Read Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8 through 3, verse 3. Ezekiel was also told to eat a scroll. So this is not brand new to scripture. What the angel is telling John to do is you got to eat it because you've got to fully digest it. You have to make the word a part of your very being. You say, Shelly, what are you talking about? Listen, I stand before you this morning. I'm about five foot six tall. I don't want to even know how wide I am, right, Betty? Okay, so here I am standing in front of you. But once, I know my mom's on here watching. She can remember holding me when I had just come, in, come out of her womb and I was very small. So how are we small and then we get big? What, what substance makes us bigger? And the answer is the nutrition that we take in, the food that we eat. Although some goes away in waste, much of it turns into chemical processes by God's mighty plan, turns into the very fiber of our being. So in a very real sense, it is true that you are what you eat physically. Amen? Now, listen, don't get discouraged on that. You know, those of you who don't eat healthily, and that's me sometimes too, okay, we... we may not be going so well physically that way, but I want you to understand the seriousness of this. You are what you eat. And some people will say to me, Shelly, I want to be on fire for Jesus Christ. I want to be full of the Spirit of God. I want to understand His will. I want to walk in His power. I want to walk in His strength. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. You must take the scroll. You must take the scroll and you must eat it. What you fill your mind with, the things that you are most exposed to, the things that you process through your brain and through your heart, whether it be the culture's ridiculousness, sinful things, television, secular commentary, I don't, whatever it is, you become what you eat. If you want to be frustrated, if you want to be sinful, if you want to be angry, if you want to be confused, take in the culture. Sit and read magazines and romance novels and, and watch television all day long. If you want to be the man or woman or teenager or child of God that God wants you to be, eat this book. 
You are what you eat. Boy, that's tough this morning. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, Lord, and I ate them. Look at this. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah said, when I found your words, I ate them and they became my joy and my delight. You'll never be who you're supposed to be for Jesus. You'll never be the person you long to be without eating the word of God. That takes time. That takes effort. You know, the digestive process, you got to look at it. You got to desire it. You got to pick it up. You got to take it to your mouth. You got to chew on it. You got to swallow it. You got to digest it. You got to let it work through your system. Same thing with the word of God. It's sitting there. You look at it. You desire it. You pick it up. You read it. You study it. You find other resources to help you digest it, to study it. You chew it. You chew it. You think about it. You maul it over. You let it occupy your thoughts and your moments of your days. You swallow it. You take it in. You act upon it. You digest it. You keep living it out till it becomes a very part of your being. Hallelujah. And then you can't help but living it. Is anybody with me out there? Are you getting this? This is exciting, exciting stuff. Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. This isn't just in the book of Revelation. It's in Jeremiah. It's in the Psalms. Psalm 119, 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you take this word in, it comes out in your actions and in your very being. Store the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. I want to share with you these wise words of the old time preacher, H.A. Ironside, regarding John eating this scroll. Look at what he said. Someone has said that meditation in these busy days of ours is a lost art. Oh, how true that is. Even more so true today. People don't like to meditate. And I'm not talking about new age meditation. My goodness, don't ever get caught up in that. Meditation is not, you ready for this? Meditation is not the emptying of your mind. Meditation is the filling of your mind with God's word. Meditate on God's word. Meditation is not emptying and breathing. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. When you purposely empty your mind and focus only on your breathing and not on God, you're opening yourself up to demonic influence. We're talking about meditating quietness with God's word and in prayer. Someone has said that meditation in these busy days of ours is a lost art. Would to God it were restored and that his people generally were more given literally to feed upon his truth. Oh, Ironside, I'm with you on this, right? It is not only that God would have John and Ezekiel to eat the book, but also that he wants you to eat the book. He has given it to you who believe on his son to be the food of your own soul and to make you fit to serve him. And remember that this is just as true of the prophetic books as it is of every other portion of the word of God. In other words, you might want to just sit in the gospels and not go anywhere else. But God wants you to know the prophecy. In both of these instances cited with John and with Ezekiel, it is particularly the prophetic word that is in view. God wanted Ezekiel to eat the prophecy. He wanted John to eat the prophecy. Lay hold of dispensational truth. I don't want you to get confused here. We teach at Hope and Passion Ministries, dispensationalism, that God works in certain ages and times in certain ways, okay? And we know the last days, the coming of the end is here. So what H.A. Ironside is saying is God wants you to particularly eat dispensational truth 
of prophetic teaching in this very practical way, and it must have a most beneficiary effect upon your inner man. It is the eating of the prophetic. Even God said that. Doesn't Revelation at the very, very beginning promise a special blessing? Like no other book does, promises a special blessing to those who would read it. God bless you. Listen, I've heard from TikToker after TikToker who has gotten onto my YouTube channel, who, who messages me and says, this is, this is so blessed. Those of you who are hope and passion, long-standing people, listen to this. I have people writing to me and saying, I am binging the book of Revelation on your YouTube channel. Why am I crying? Because there's a whole lot of stuff people can binge today on television. There's a whole lot of ridiculous programs that we can sit down and watch episode after episode after episode. And we got people binging the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. And lives are being changed. And they're writing to me and they're saying, I don't understand what's happening. My life is completely turned around. I'm on fire for Jesus. I'm witnessing to my friends. I'm feeling the power of the Holy Spirit when I talk. Yeah. You're eating the word of God. Hallelujah. This is incredible stuff that's taking place. A special blessing to those who will digest it. Verse 10, and I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Now, this is the last point. I want you to hang in there. And I want you to think about this. John was told it's going to taste good to eat it, but it's going to make your stomach bitter. What's going on there? You know, some of you heard me preach this before, but a lot of people, when they think of Noah's Ark, they think of images like this that we put in a baby's room to decorate with Noah's Ark decor. And it's so sad because people will picture that the animals and Noah and his family, you know, during the flood, they're on the ark and they're smiling and waving. Here we are, you know. That is not at all what was happening. While that flood was taking place outside the ark, you know, the door of the ark had shut and untold numbers of people were dying while Noah and his family and the animals were inside the ark. No doubt what they heard through the windows was screaming. They weren't waving and smiling, Noah and his family and the animals. They heard this, the cries and the screaming of the people who were dying. I believe that there were parents who were trying to run up into treetops and, and run up mountains. In, a, in an attempt to escape the rising floodwaters, but soon they were overtaken. People were being drowned. They were dying. This wasn't a time of rejoicing. It was a time to be, I can't wait to talk to Noah someday in heaven. It was a time to be in the ark, in the safety of the ark, so grateful for what God had done for you but so broken that those outside had missed it, that they had rejected God. And I believe that's what's happening here. John said, I love, and I would agree with John, I love to read prophecy. It makes my heart so overjoyed to know that God wins. And I'm so grateful to know that I'm on his side. But my heart breaks. And that is why I spend every ounce of energy and time that I possibly can to keep running toward the darkness with the truth of God in every way that God opens it up. Because my heart is broken for those who are dying. Jesus said his coming will be like it was in the days of Noah. When people didn't pay attention to Noah's righteous preaching. And they were all suddenly swept away by the flood. That doesn't make us happy. It leaves a bitterness in our stomach. 
Leon Morris said the true preacher of God's word will faithfully proclaim the denunciations of the wicked that it contains, whatever this word says. But he does not do this with fierce glee. The more his heart is filled with the love of God, the more certain it is that the telling forth of the woes will be a bitter experience. I am sad to say that I see some preachers and teachers of the word of God. I see some people who call themselves Christians on social media, any opportunity they can. Oh, I see supposed Christian uh, adults on TikTok and adults on social media who very sadly mock the unsaved. They're not trying to reach the unsaved or be straightforward about the delusion of the unsaved. They're mocking them. They're laughing. They're having a good time. And I don't care. You know, this gets into the political realm too. Yes, there are people in politics who are unsaved, who are damned, who are away from Jesus Christ. And yes, they're doing damage. They're wreaking havoc. But it is not our place to mock the damned and the unsaved. That kind of judgment should dishearten us. God delights in mercy. God's default position is one of mercy. Though he will enact judgment, he does not rejoice in it. And neither should we. We should never rejoice or happily mock or make light of the unsaved. I'm going to end with this scripture, 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. The Apostle Paul said, We Christians are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. And we're the aroma of Christ to, of God to those who are perishing. To those who are saved and to those who are perishing, they're still going to see Christ and hear Christ through me. But here's the difference. To one... I'm a fragrance from death to death. To the unsaved, to the mocker, and I get it almost every day on TikTok, you know, I'm preaching Christ. It's still Christ in me. But to people who are dying, who have rejected Christ already, it's just further damnation to their soul because they continue to reject. And we're the aroma of death to death. But to the saved, we're the fragrance from life to more life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God. In the sight of God, we speak in Christ. I want you to remember something. As you're taking in and eating God's word, remember that it will be sweet to your mouth but there's a bitterness when we realize the judgment that the world is going through. We know that a Christian matures in the sobering reality of judgment to come and yet the hope ahead is seen in that person. When things are not taken lightly, whether good or bad, but things are carefully considered because we know the reality of what's to come. And then finally, John was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. That bitter feeling in his stomach was there because John was going to quickly be getting revelation as we're going to be learning soon about the Antichrist directly. He is soon going to be given description of the beast and the Antichrist system. He is soon going to be given information as next week we're going to learn about many Gentile nations who will trample down the temple in Jerusalem, who will join the Antichrist, who will come against Jesus, the very peoples who will be destroyed in the battle of Armageddon. And that's a very good place to leave off today because I want to tell you, Next week when we talk about the uh, temple, it's going to be incredible. You know, I can't get my clicker to work again, so I'm going to leave it there. I want to pray. I want to remind you 
to keep in mind everything we've said today, to make the Word of God a part of your very, very being. And please remember to pray. If you believe in what we're doing here at Hope and Passion Ministries, go to hopeandpassion.org. That's hopeandpassion.org. And become a partner with us. Give financially. Let that be a part of your worship that we can continue to spread God's word to as many as possible. Lord Jesus, thank you this morning. It's been a wonderful time in your word. It's been a convicting time in your word. It's been a sobering time. My prayer is that each and every one who's watching this would be sure to call upon you from the depths of their heart to save them from their sin by the blood of Jesus, to turn to you, dear Lord, for full salvation, and that those of us who already have would grow more and more in love with you, would take more and more seriously our calling in this world. This world for the Christian is not a playground. It's a battleground. We are called to win souls for Jesus Christ. And I thank you for that calling, that privilege, and that honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for sticking with me. I know we went a little over time, but it's been a wonderful morning in the Word. I invite you to join me next week to study the Tribulation Temple in Revelation chapter 11. In the meantime, we love you. We're praying for you.